Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Professor Eduardo Adadal. I'm a faculty member at the school, and uh, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this event on the societal implications of an AI-powered world. Uh, all of us in this room have experienced the power of technology. Many barriers to information, communication, commerce, research uh, have been broken. Today, we can do more faster, better, and cheaper because of technology. The trends of mobile, social media, big data, and cloud computing are changing the ways we live, work, and play. Even as we celebrate the wonders and benefits of technology, we are also aware of its dark side. One only has to open the newspaper these days about Facebook, Uber, and all that stuff to realize the dangers of technology. So every new technology can bring with, with it benefits and disruption. This is why at the Lee Kuan Yew School tonight we are happy to, to launch our program on disruptive technologies and public policy. Our aim is to leverage technology to empower people, organizations, and governments to achieve more. We especially thank our partnership uh, with Microsoft for the support uh, in the last four years. And of course, we thank our uh, events team for uh, organizing this event. Today, tonight, we are very fortunate to have two special guests to address the topic of new disruptive technology, particularly AI and its social implications. I will first call on our uh, speaker, Senior Minister of State, Janil Puticherry, who will provide us with in his uh, introductory remarks. Uh, Dr. Janil Puticherry, as you know, is a medical uh, doctor. He was elected as a member of parliament in 2011. He is currently Senior State Minister of State for uh, Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Communications and Information. His portfolio includes education for children with disabilities and special needs. He is concurrently the minister in charge of the Government Technology Agency, or GovTech, where he coordinates GovTech's strategy with industry development efforts as part of the Smart Nation Initiative. Uh, Dr. Puticherry is the Vice Chairman of the Pasir Ris Pungol Town Council and he was, he's also Chair of the One People SG, which works to promote racial harmony in Singapore. And he's also part of the Young PAP, the Youth Wing of the People's Action Party. Prior to entering politics, he worked as a Senior Consultant at the Children's Intensive Care Unit at KK Women's and Children's Hospital. He's also a fellow academic. Uh, having been an associate professor at the Duke NUS Graduate Medical School. Uh, Minister Puticherry, please. Thank you very much for that introduction, Professor Arral. I, I was just listening to that and I thought I must shorten my Wikipedia page entry. <laughs> <laughs> professor Arral, Mr. Brad Smith, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me here today. Uh, and on this lecture about addressing the societal implications of an AI-powered world. The hyperbole, the speculation, the breathless commentary on artificial intelligence can potentially generate quite a lot of confusion, quite a lot of anxiety, but that process doesn't necessarily lead us any closer to solutions. What we need is a healthy exchange of considered views, get the regulators, the academics, the practitioners, the technical professionals together and work out a practical approach to the societal issues, the economic issues and the social concerns that are driven from AI long before we achieve absolute clarity about exactly when the singularity is going to happen and Skynet is going to take over. So I'm happy to join you here at this public lecture, which I'm sure will be an informed discourse demystifying some of the issues around artificial intelligence, thinking about practical responses as we adopt this new technology. The hyperbole that I talked about suggests that AI is already transformative to the point of uh, huge disruption. But the reality is that many of the technologies that are today mature enough for deployment are narrow, they're function specific, they're targeted, and they're focused on existing business opportunities, existing processes, existing interventions with people in the loop. They augment and assist human decision making, image recognition, speech processing, and many other examples. I'm sure the, the technological revolution is going to keep on happening, but it's not going to happen in a single discrete step. It's an incremental progressive change. 
And as it happens around us, as it happens in real time, what was previously seen as groundbreaking technology, what was previously seen as the remit of AI researchers, becomes commonplace accepted computational capability. Expert systems, face recognition, speech processing, all of these were previously under the remit of AI technology and now are very much part of the normal expectation of computation. So it means that from a policy perspective, we need to focus on the risks and issues that can be foreseen on the basis of what is happening today and perhaps accept there are going to be some unknown unknowns and we'll deal with them when the time comes. We have to deal with this in Singapore with a pragmatic policy response. We need to allow the technology to develop, to continue to mature and, and not hinder that progress even as we ensure that the public interest is protected. We have done this before. This approach around technological revolutions is not new. The speed and the scale and the, the pocket-sized nature of the computing ability is new, it's different. But the approach is not necessarily new. We've done something similar with the uh, widespread use of the internet and the push for national computerization following the 1990s. And even as we did that, we recognized that risks were inherent, and as they are even in human control systems. How do we then mitigate potential risks in current systems as we think about the transition to AI augmented systems? while maximizing the benefits. And ultimately, we need to make the case that doing so, even as we deal with the risks, experience the risks, and learn from the risks, we need to make the case that doing so will bring about significant long-term transformative social and economic impacts. One example of what's now possible, when DBS launched its uh, mobile-only banks in India and Indonesia, something that would not have been possible only a few years ago, prior to the kind of connectivity as well as the kind of mobile computing platforms that are cheap enough to deploy across vast swathes of geography and across millions of people of a population. Broad-based access to high-quality banking solutions. Uh, I mean high-quality from a connectivity and technical perspective. I'm not making a value judgment about the relative merits of banks. Um, uh, it, it results in a social shift to take the unbanked and make them, uh, give them access to, to banking services. A social shift as well as potentially a significant economic outcome. So a risk-based approach, building accountability and trust so that we can have this type of uh, visible impact on the public to demonstrate that technological innovation can lead to better lives. Some key principles. On a national basis, we need to, we want to, and we will be proactive. We need to be an active player and influence and shape the development of this space. We don't want to be a passive respondent. This complements our approach to how we've invested in developing AI capability. We've already set aside hundreds of millions of dollars to develop AI, AI-related technologies and data science technologies. Programs like the Smart System Strategic Research Program, AI.SG, initiatives to help industry adopt and improve public service delivery uh, mechanisms. We have to develop our governance frameworks concurrently to support the AI use so that it is trustworthy and acceptable. And to do so early gives regulatory clarity. We have a great incentive to be able to express clearly what is the way we're approaching AI governance to provide businesses that regulatory clarity so that they will invest here, create jobs, and help to have international norms that will create the kind of economic environment in which Singapore thrives. And to do so today, while these norms are nascent and still developing. We have started structures and programs to address these new AI risks and governance, governance approaches. We have a regulators round table, regulators across domains such as transport, health and finance, where the impact of AI in these spaces, the needed regulatory responses are not quite so clear. So where things are very nascent, where things are still developing, we're looking horizontally across domains, trying to bring the skills together and making sure we produce the platforms that when the knowledge is there, when the opportunity is there, they will be rapidly propagated across our system. But in other domains, where the technology, the business model, and the economic case is uh, effective, where the disruption is already happening, we're taking an industry-specific approach. One example is the Monetary Authority of Singapore. 
bringing together thought leaders, practitioners in data analytics, together with financiers and various other professionals in the financial sector, and setting up the Fairness, Ethics, Accountability, and Transparency Committee, specifically looking at this issue of how AI can be deployed in the finance space, promoting responsible and ethical use of the technology and the data analytical outcomes from that technology, setting out key principles, best practices. So we would like to move as far as possible towards an industry-specific approach around the governance of AI. So set up broad horizontal programs, broad horizontal structures, but when it becomes possible, when it becomes clear that there is both the need, the capability, as well as the regulatory opportunity to do so, go for an industry-specific approach. We, we recognize, and we do this because we recognize this not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution. There is no generic AI risk governance solution. The sectors are, diver are diverse, the business models are diverse, and the implications are going to be diverse. But we do still need some broad principles. Broad principles for the purposes of public accountability, for the purposes of business confidence, and for the purposes of thinking about future policy decisions on the foundation of what we have done today. What might these broad principles be across the whole of government? The first is that we need to try as hard as possible to ensure that the algorithmic decisions, the output of AI-driven processes, are explainable and transparent. The, a lot of the public anxiety is about the sort of rogue decision-making, the inscrutability and ineffability of what happens in the black box. When, when applications or processes are triaged in a certain way or rejected, what is the mechanism to ensure that these are done on a fair and transparent basis? When failure occurs, as it will do in any technologically complex situation, did that failure occur as a result of an explainable process? Or are we happy with the black box, inscrutable, ineffable process? And we shouldn't be. We should demand some degree of explanation. Because that will drive trust. We, we are not suggesting, of course, that we have to be uh, completely ignorant of the extent to which intellectual property must be protected. Uh, an, industry's competitive, uh, uh, an industrial player's competitive advantage needs to be protected. But from the point of view of the relationship between the industry and the regulators, we need to develop the maturity around that process to expect that we are going to have to explain ourselves as industry players and as regulators to the public about these AI-driven algorithmic-based de uh, decisions in a way that the public accepts is sufficiently transparent and sufficiently fair when the technology is deployed. The second principle across the whole of government is also fairness, but fairness in a different dimension, which is the removal of human bias. There is every opportunity, depending on how we engineer AI-driven or algorithmic-driven solutions, there is every possibility that existing human bias gets coded in, gets amplified, gets institutionalized. And so one guiding principle has to be that it needs to be objectively demonstrable, objectively demonstrable, that the deployment of an AI-based solution or an algorithmic-based solution is not amplifying, institutionalizing, hard coding in a human bias that may have been present before or is allowed to creep in. And there are some examples of this out there, uh, you know, chat box that went wrong and so forth, but when it affects healthcare, when it affects defense, when it affects security, the public is not going to be so forgiving. And we need to be objectively able to demonstrate that we have taken appropriate steps as industry players and as regulators to ensure that human bias is removed. And thirdly, the final principle, safety. We, that idea of beneficence, whether it's physical, financial, or social, and especially as increasingly consequential decisions are interested to these support technologies. The public has to be repeatedly re reassured of their safety and well-being. The tolerance of harm, the tolerance of risk will and needs to vary with industry. But as we go down this development path, we need to have a high regard for the role of safety and, and be cautious. Because maintaining that public trust in both the regulatory capability as well as the industry development is going to be fundamental at providing us the opportunity to exploit these technologies. Risk assessments, impact assessments, adequate testing, necessary limits to mitigate harm. 
Industry has a responsibility, so has the regulatory uh, organizations. So, if I could give you one example of that would be LTA's approach to autonomous vehicles. Autonomous vehicles have been in the news uh, quite significantly, but LTA has imposed a progressive testing process, holding the autonomous vehicle to a safety bar that is much higher than a, than a human would be, which goes against the grain about the arguments that ultimately an autonomous vehicle would be safer than a human. But that's the ultimate aim that we want to get to. On our journey there, we need to, as a matter of principle, reverse the argument and ensure that that higher safety standard is delivered and objectively demonstrated. So progressive testing, uh, enclosed spaces, delimited roads, lower speeds, certain conditions, progressively moving up to more challenging conditions and, and a wider space. Progressive testing allowing developers to advance technology, but ultimately minimizing risk and increasing public trust in the process. So if I might summarize the guiding principles, on a national basis, we want to be active players in this space. We don't want to be a passive respondent to what's happening and where norms are set and we have no say in the process. We, over time, want to move towards an industry-specific process of governing the risks around AI. And I didn't say this in my earlier part of the speech, but ultimately we need to be agile as a nation around this. Whatever I've scoped out may well need to change in six months or one year from now, and we have to demonstrate the commitment to be agile and responsive to the technological developments as it happens. When Skynet appears, I want to be able to give him or her or it an NRIC number. <laughs> From a regulatory point of view, demonstrate that the tools and the algorithms behind them are transparent and explainable to a reasonable degree, not an absolute degree, to a reasonable degree. Demonstrate objectively that the processes do not amplify human biases and ultimately, thirdly, they are safe. From a government perspective, what do we need to do? Well, we have and we need to continue to invest in our people in terms of making sure that we have the right educational base for this, in our infrastructure to support the connectivity that is a key requirement for the development of these types of technologies and their deployment, and the public sector capability to ensure that these tools are used maximally for the public good. We need to partner with industry in every step of the way, from thinking about the, the development, from thinking about the research, thinking about the regulations, and ultimately as a provider of these solutions. And we need to actively consider what we need to change from a regulator's point of view and from a legislative point of view, proactively to enable the maximal exploitation of these technologies for the public good. We're only at the start of what could potentially be a very exciting and transformative journey around the deployment and development of artificial intelligence. We should move away from the hyperbole, think about it with some degree of pragmatism, but some bold vision. We have to believe that this is a space that we can get into and do quite a lot of things with, manage the risks, reduce the harm, and ultimately exploit the benefits to help our society. I look forward very much to Mr. Brad Smith's talk and uh, the panel discussion after. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister uh, Puticherry. While listening to your talk, I'm reminded of a principle that we teach in our classroom. And that principle is uh, the principle of the iron law of regulation, which, which is that a common set of regulation applied to a common set of industry would have differential effects on the companies within that industry because they would have different business models. So I think that that's a very useful uh, way of thinking about regulation. So thank you very much. Our next speaker comes from the private sector, uh, Mr. Brad Smith. Uh, he has been called by the New York Times as the de facto ambassador for the technology industry at large. And more recently by the Geek Wire as the tech industry's unofficial diplomat to Washington. I, I googled this, Brad, so I, I could find out what, uh, what you're up to. As a School of Public Policy, we are pleased to welcome Brad, given his proven thought leadership on technology, laws, policy, ethics, and governance. He's been with Microsoft since time immemorial, since 1993. Uh, so, but he has an interesting relationship with our uh, acting dean, uh, Daniqua. They come from Princeton. Uh, so he's responsible for Microsoft's uh, corporate, external, and legal affairs 
leading a team of more than 1,400 business, legal, and corporate affairs professionals working in 55 countries, including my boss, uh, Astrid. Uh, these teams are responsible for Microsoft's legal work, intellectual uh, property por portfolio, patent licensing, corporate philanthropy, government affairs, public policy, so on and so forth. Uh, so, please welcome Ambassador Brad Smith. Well, good evening or good afternoon. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I want you to know I was very much reassured when this started to come down because I was trying to figure out how I could possibly show slides without a screen on which to show them. Um, but it's a great honor to be here, to follow the senior minister, to you know, be really joined with all of you this evening, uh, and to be back in Singapore. Uh, it's such an important crossroads for the world, not just for physical goods and people, but really for ideas. And I think this is an opportunity to talk about how, how ideas not only can come together around the world, but how ideas can come together between the world of technology and the world of public policy. Uh, as we look to the future, I think that there are a few topics that are more important than the future of artificial intelligence. And you're going to find that a lot of what I have to say is very much in agreement with what you just heard. But it'll be interesting, I think, to have the opportunity to put them together, one from the world of government, the other from the world of technology. Uh, these are issues that we sought to address in Microsoft just a few months ago. We published a book called The Future Computed. It talks about artificial intelligence, but not just from the perspective of where the technology is going, but from what it means for society. And as we wrote the book, and as Harry Shum, who is the head of our artificial intelligence group, and I co-authored the foreword, we started not by looking forward, but by looking backwards, because it provides a perspective, I think, of where we might expect technology to go. We started by thinking about the way our days began 20 years ago in 1998. If you think about what life was like just two decades ago when we got up, we checked out the news, but we did it by turning on the television set, by listening to the radio, by reading the newspaper the old fashioned way, by flipping between pages of paper. We checked out the weather forecast. We might have called someone to arrange an appointment to meet for dinner. If they weren't there, we left a message on their answering machine. And 20 years ago, everywhere around the world, there was probably one joke told more often about technology than anything else. Could people actually program the VCR, not only to record a television show, but to get that 12 o'clock number to stop blinking? <laughs> Most people could not. Well, now think about the world today doesn't matter where you are. In all probability, people so often start their day by looking at their device. Typically their smartphone, maybe they sit down at a laptop or desktop computer. They find out what happened in the world while they were sleeping by looking at a news feed. They actually find out what has happened to their friends and their family by checking out a news feed. It may have been a Facebook or another social media news feed. You connect with your family and friends, you arrange for dinner, but you're more likely to do it on a text message. And if you need to catch up with programming, you're more likely to do it with a service like Netflix or something else that you can catch up with on a device. Now let's think about the future 20 years from now. We may still look at a device like a phone or something similar, but in all probability, it's going to be powered by artificial intelligence. We may be standing in the bathroom, shaving if you're a man, putting on makeup if you're a woman, listening to your newsfeed read to you by a digital assistant. It may highlight what it knows you're most interested in, whether it's a news topic or your friends. It may remind you of what you need to do that day. You may even have your first meeting from home, and if you do, you may find that there are people who speak multiple languages, all speaking their native language, and then having it translated for you by the computer. All of these things are rapidly moving forward. Ultimately, I think it is important to demystify artificial intelligence. There is simply no way we can govern it unless we can demystify it. Part of that involves really understanding what artificial intelligence is. 
And in our view, it's really two things. First, it is giving computers the ability to perceive what it is happening around the world in the same way that humans do. A lot of that is vision and speech. If you think about vision, machines have been able to capture what is happening in the world since the invention of the camera. But what is different today is that computers can understand and identify the images at a level that is comparable to human beings. And similarly, machines have been able to record what is happening in the world audibly, literally since the invention of the phonograph. But today, computers are able to understand human speech at a level that is now on a par with human beings. Our own researchers have met both of those thresholds over the last couple of years. The other part of this is human cognition. One big part of human cognition involves the ability to translate from one language to another. And now we're suddenly finding that computers are able to match human beings in this as well. And of course, they can scale in a way that it is difficult for human beings to scale. We now have the ability to do translate between dozens of languages simultaneously, and that number will continue to grow. And finally, there is the ability to learn to recognize patterns, to reach conclusions based on them to reason. All of these are areas where computers are racing ahead. While we wait for the so-called singularity, what we're really finding is that artificial intelligence is already taking flight on a feature-by-feature -feature basis all around us. Take vision. If you buy a new car from BMW or many other manufacturers, you're likely to find that if a pedestrian walks into the street, there is a camera on the front of the car, it recognizes that there is a human being and there is an alert that goes off to help the driver know what is happening. When it comes to speech, there's an app that you can download for your iPhone called the Steno app. The Steno app not only does what tape recorders have long done, namely record what is being said, but it instantly transcribes it automatically and creates a written transcript as well. Or in the world of language translation, you can take something like our Skype translator application, which has the ability to translate between different languages. Two people can talk with each other without speaking the same language. The computer understands the speech, translates it into another language, and then creates a text so someone can see it. And increasingly, we're finding that this is not just an exercise of one language into another. It's the ability to match human beings, in fact, in combining languages, sometimes into single sentences. At Microsoft Research, our basic research arm, we're pursuing a project called Project Melange. And what it does is focus on what's called code mixing, the use of words from multiple languages in a single sentence. It's very common in parts of the world where people speak multiple languages or people come from multiple cultures. One of the things that we did as I was getting ready to come here was look at recent usage of Twitter in Singapore. And what we found was that 7% of all of the tweets in Singapore consisted of sentences that actually combined words from more than one language. You can see here the different languages that were often mixed together. You can see the different cultural and national groups that would combine with English words from their native language. And what we're now creating is the ability for AI to collect and understand this mixture together. Finally, for anybody who uses products like Spotify or Netflix and iTunes, well, we already experience machine learning all around us. If you listen to one song and watch one program, you're going to get a suggestion about the next song or the next program based on knowledge about what other people have listened to and whether they've liked what has followed. A good example of machine learning. Ultimately, all of these advances are being driven by fundamentally two technologies, really the defining information technologies of this decade. The first is the use of vast amounts of data increasingly large data sets. Almost all advances in, an, in AI require the use of larger and larger data sets. And the other is huge computational power, the kind of computational power you find in large data centers in the cloud. 
Because now people have the ability to access the power they need when they need it without having to pay for all of this hardware themselves. All of these things are exciting. But if there's one other point that we made in our book, it's this. We cannot afford to look at the future with uncritical eyes. We have to be alert to the challenges and problems and not just the opportunities and benefits. Fundamentally, we need to ask ourselves one of the most important questions of all. As computers behave more like humans, how will they impact real people? I think it's especially important to pause and reflect on that question on a year during recent months when Stephen Hawking has passed away and remember the cautionary tale that he has left with all of us. And reflect on the fact that in so many ways, the question for our time is to think about ultimately not just what computers can do, but to ask ourselves what computers should do. That is, in essence, what the senior minister was posing. And like the government here, as he put it, we too have been thinking about how we ensure an ethical future for artificial intelligence. What we've sought to do, what we've shown in this book, is our sense of six ethical principles that you need that do need to come together. And if you were listening before, you're going to find that these are rather familiar because there's almost complete overlap in what we're talking about, which I think is encouraging. When we think about these six, we start with fairness, which really is about eliminating bias and especially eliminating unlawful discrimination and demonstrating in appropriate and objective ways that that bias has been addressed. It is about ensuring that this technology is reliable and safe. And here we can build on the laws and principles and norms that have long existed in countries around the world. Principles and norms that I think it's worth recalling fundamentally were born as a result of railroads and automobiles and the first technology that people decided needed to be addressed and regulated in order to ensure proper safety. We certainly need to think hard about privacy and security. In fact, all we have to do this very day, this very week, is look at the headlines to appreciate the importance of those issues. We would add inclusiveness, as I'll show in a moment. This technology will have such a powerful impact on people with disabilities, either good or bad. We need to ensure that people think hard about what it can and should do to improve people's lives. All four of these rely on two others. One is transparency, which as you heard, is really not just about making sure that people know what computers are doing, but ensuring that what they are doing is explainable and therefore understandable to governments and to the public at large. And if there is a bedrock principle on which everything else relies, it is this. It is accountability. It is about ensuring that computers that can make decisions nonetheless remain accountable to human beings. That there is the opportunity for intervention by human beings before computers execute the decisions they will be capable of executing. And it will be about ensuring that the people who design and operate these AI systems remain, about, remain accountable to the rest of society pursuant to law and regulation. I will say, despite having spent a lot of time at Microsoft on each and all of these six, we have found that they're all important and yet collectively they don't quite go far enough. And so I think it's particularly fitting to follow someone who has been trained in medicine to say that what we have concluded, that in addition to all of this, the world really does need a Hippocratic Oath for coders the way it has had for doctors. We need to train a new generation of computer scientists and data scientists to understand, to think about, and really define what it means to ensure that AI does no harm. So one of the things we've sought in this book to do is to encourage a conversation around the world. And one of the things we're encouraged by is to see people, including people in universities, faculty and students, take up that opportunity and start to compose different versions of this Hippocratic Oath. Ultimately, we need to recognize that AI isn't going to be created by some small group of technology companies. It is going to be created by people everywhere. Our strategy as a company is to create the building blocks and make them available so people can create their own services based on speech 
or vision or language translation or knowledge and learning. And what that means is that ethical principles need to be internalized everywhere. And fundamentally, all of this also explains something else. If we want our timeless values to endure, if we want to have a world where not only ethical people behave ethically, but everyone behaves ethically, we're going to need to work towards a new generation of laws and policies. It is the only way to ensure a common set of standards. And if we're going to do all of this well, it actually means that in technology companies, one other thing is going to change as well. We're going to find that skilling up for this AI future requires not only people who are trained in science, technology, engineering, and math, but we're going to find more people who are employed on creating technology, who come from the humanities, who come from the social sciences, who come from this school. They, too, will have a fundamental role to play in designing these systems, because that is the only way to ensure that technology will behave like the human beings and with the humanitarian sense that we want computers to be sensitive to address. We are also focused on looking beyond these critical ethical issues at other public policies. Because everywhere one goes in the world today, one finds people asking a common question. What will this mean for the future of jobs? What will it mean for me? Will I have a job? What will it mean for my children and grandchildren? Where, where will they be able to work? I want to offer some thoughts on that. Now, before one predicts the future, I think one always needs to stop and pause and acknowledge there is no crystal ball. I can tell you with great confidence what the world will look like in 10 years, knowing that full well nine years from now you'll have forgotten exactly everything I said. But I think one does have an opportunity to make certain predictions with some confidence. And one can do it in two ways. The first is to look towards the future by learning from the past. Because while it is difficult to see the future, we have great hindsight when we look backwards. And we can learn from the technology transitions the world has experienced before including right here in Singapore. We can learn from the transition of the economy, say, from horses to automobiles. You can consider this photograph, for example. Interestingly, if you look at this photograph, it was taken in 1910, 22 years after the invention of the automobile in Germany. And if you look at this photograph carefully, you will see horses and carriages and not a single automobile. There had been 22 years of hype. And if you look at a photograph of Berlin or a photograph of New York, it looked exactly the same way. After two decades, cars were not yet common. That was in 1910. And yet here, just 20, sorry, just 10 years after, in 1920, there were so many cars, they cut down the trees to make room for them to park. The horses had been crowded to the side. By that time, the future was clear. This fellow lost his job. <laughs> and the effects throughout the economy were widespread. Now, some of them, and especially in hindsight, were relatively easy to predict. Because there were a number of direct economic effects. There were fewer jobs for people who were cleaning up after horses for grooming horses, for building carriages that were pulled by horses. And suddenly there were new jobs for auto mechanics, for people who could drive cars, for people who could put fuel, gasoline, into cars. Those, you might say, were predictable. What is more interesting, I think, is the things that I think were unpredictable, even in hindsight. Consider some of the indirect economic effects and new jobs that were created. Consumer credit was really born because of the automobile. People needed a lot of money to buy a car, more money than they had. So there was invented a whole new line of finance, the consumer credit line of finance. Or advertising. Suddenly people were driving down the road, not at the speed of a horse, but at 30 or 35 kilometers an hour. They needed to be able to look at a billboard instantly and not only recognize the product, but the company that had produced it. The world of corporate logos that we take for granted all around us today 
was really born with the automobile. More sobering, however, was the downside, the negative effects that were indirect, but very substantial. If you go back and look at the Great Depression, in 1933 in the United States, at the height of the Great Depression, the Bureau of the Census published a report that showed that one of the main contributing factors of the present economic situation, something that affected the entire country, was the decline of the horse. How could that be? Well, it was this. In 1905, before those automobiles started to proliferate, 25% of all of the agricultural produce in the United States was used to feed horses. When the horse population declined, farmers changed what they planted. Horses like to eat hay. People don't really like to eat hay. So the farmers changed what they planted and focused on wheat and corn. There was an overproduction of wheat and corn. The prices of wheat and corn plummeted. As the prices of those crops plummeted, the incomes of farmers plummeted. As their incomes fell, they could not repay the banks on their mortgages. So the rural banks started to foreclose on the farmers. The rural banks were foreclosing on so many farms that they could not keep up, and the rural banks began to reach the point where they could not repay the urban banks for the money that they had borrowed for them, and the entire financial system basically collapsed. You heard earlier about the importance of agility. That story, I think more than anything else, shows that we can't possibly predict everything that is coming. And governments, in particular, will need to be agile to address the new issues that may, that may well arise. There's another lesson that comes from the past. It's a past that's closer to home. It's what we saw when information technology made its way into offices around the world. Before we had computers and word processing programs like Microsoft Word, we had typewriters and people who used them called secretaries, most often women who worked in offices. Well, of course, today when you walk into an office, you no longer see many of those jobs. Everybody is expected to write on their own devices themselves. But what is interesting in, is this. In the 1980s and 90s, as computers spread into offices, employers invested in training. Training budgets rose. People recognized that employees needed to be trained. But today, we expect people to know these skills when they come in. And over the last decade around the world, training budgets have fallen. But in an AI-infused world, just as everybody needed to learn how to use a computer, many of us will need to learn how to use AI. Training budgets for employers are going to need to increase. This fundamentally causes us to ask, how will work change? And that leads to a series of questions. One is, well, what jobs can AI replace? As we think about the answer to that question, I think we can learn not so much from history, but we can take stock of the technology itself. In a way, it's common sense. AI is most likely to replace jobs that involve tasks that computers can do well. So what are those jobs? Well, let's go back to what AI is. Think about vision and the ability of computers to see and analyze and make decisions based on an understanding of what that image is. That's called reading an x-ray, something radiologists do. Increasingly, that's what a driver of a vehicle does. It take, a person takes stock of what is happening and makes decisions based on it. Think about what it means to understand speech, analyze what someone is saying, and make a decision about it. I think we'll see over the next decade many jobs and call centers replaced by AI-based computers. Already, if you call a company and ask for customer support, you may find that the single most difficult thing ahead of you is trying to talk to a human being. Because we're already seeing these systems enter the workspace. If you want to predict a job that will almost certainly disappear in the next five years, my leading candidate is this. It is the job of someone who works in a fast food restaurant taking an order from somebody going through the drive through Think about what that person does. They listen to what is said, and they enter what the person says on a computer. Two hamburgers, one french fry. Well, computers already are matching that capability. And so when we walk through the drive, if we go through the drive through five years from now, 
we're much more likely to be talking to a computer than a human being. Language and translation and interpreters are all things that are going to be increasingly replaced by computers. Now, I will acknowledge this. Last year, when I was in Berlin with Satya Nadella, our CEO, we met with Chancellor Merkel in her office, and she had her interpreter. And Satya was explaining that computers are going to take over the job of interpreters. He then turned to our interpreter and he said, I'm sorry. She said, you don't need to be sorry. Somebody from IBM told me that 20 years ago, and I am still here. <laughs> so the ability to predict when these things happen is sometimes much more difficult than it is to predict the direction in which things will head. But finally, in the world of learning, the ability to inspect machines, even low-level legal tasks, here too, AI will increasingly step in. On the other hand, there's some jobs that probably won't be replaced. It's the things that computers cannot do well. Jobs that require human empathy, understanding, moral support. It's highly likely that nurses, social workers, teachers, and therapists will all use AI, but their jobs are much less likely to change. There's another question that is important to think about in terms of the workplace, and that is how can AI empower people? In the world today, one out of every seven individuals has some kind of physical disability. It might be permanent, it might be temporary, and here AI can perhaps do more and do more and more quickly than in any other area to improve people's lives. It can help people who suffer from blindness to see because the computer can see and talk to them. It can help people who are deaf or suffer from deafness hear because the computer can hear and tell them by typing words what is being said. And if you have any doubts about this, let me show you a two minute video that captures what some of our work in our basic research team has done just to help people who suffer from vision impairment. Even though we only released that last July on basically a test basis, it has already completed more than three million tasks for people around the world. And with each of those tasks and that additional data, it keeps getting smarter and more powerful. So there is cause for optimism, not only there, but in other spaces, because another one of the important questions is what jobs will AI create? Well, most studies are predicting that 12 years from now, if you look out at the economy, over 60% of the jobs that will exist at that time do not yet exist today. There will be all kinds of new fields that are using AI and putting it to work in ways that we can't yet imagine. And it's not just AI by itself, it's AI in conjunction with new technologies. One of the things that we've been focused on is augmented reality, the ability to put on glasses and see the world around you but project holographic or other images at the same time. While much of the early use is sometimes focused on games and entertainment, in fact, this is changing many jobs around the world from architecture to medicine. And companies are already applying it. Companies like Japan Airlines. In the past, in order to train a mechanic on a new engine, the airline literally had to take the aircraft offline so people could work with the aircraft engine manually. Now they can put on the HoloLens glasses, they can see a holographic image, and they can look at the manual at the same time. It's being used for pilots as well, who no longer need to go into a physical simulator in order to learn how to pilot a new plane. Or take a company like ThyssenKrupp, a German company that has long built elevators, including elevators that go into a home, a flat, or a house, where people who are older may want something that will go up the stairs. Well, using the HoloLens, people are now trained. There are new jobs. They go in, they design the specifications, at a quarter of the time that it used to take. So you see these kinds of jobs literally springing up around us. One of the questions it causes us to ask is what disciplines will be required to make AI work well? Well, it's easy to say that so many of these new jobs are going to require people with greater expertise in computer science and data science. But as you saw before, ethics, the humanities, the social sciences, will be important as well. Not just for the use of AI in these new jobs, but to use AI in existing jobs. 
Because what we're finding is that AI is being put to work in a variety of ways in existing fields. Take something like the humanities at Princeton, where I went to school. There is a humanities professor who studies documents from Egypt that were written in the 12th century. Well, it turns out that these documents were broken up over time. They're scattered in libraries around the world. One of the challenges for historians and scholars is to find the pieces and put them back together. The first step involved digitizing them, but the second step involved using AI to match the fragments and put them together. And whether we're learning about the past or thinking about the future in fields like environmental science, AI is making people smarter. Ultimately, we have to ask ourselves, what will it take to prepare for an AI-powered future? It's schools like this where those questions will be answered. Because we'll need a new social contract, something that focuses on what it really takes to equip people with new skills, with new pathways between careers. We'll need to think about how the labor market is changing and what rules will be needed to protect people. We'll even need to think about the social safety net. And if there's one thing we'll need to do, perhaps above all else, it's this. It's to equip people with the skills they will need to succeed. That's why, frankly, it's so exciting to come to a place like Singapore and see the important work that is already moving forward here. Work that in many ways is at the forefront of what is happening around the world. At the end of the day, AI does have a fundamental power to make the world a better place. It will play a key role in helping to cure cancer. It will change the world of medicine. It will make farmers more productive farmers, increasing their yields and reducing their environmental impact. It will help people with disabilities around the world. It may literally help us address the climate issues that are so pressing and help us save the planet. But the only way to do that well is to consider not only the opportunities but the challenges, not only the benefits, but the problems, and to do it in a way that brings people together, people from technology and the world of policy, people who come from tech companies and the world of government. And the only way to do that well is to come to places like this where we can talk together. Thank you very much. Please make the questions uh, short and sweet, and you're only entitled to one question. But let, let me take the chairman's prerogative and start off with one, uh, one question for the minister and for Brad. Both of you spoke about the importance of ethics. And, and we know uh, we teach game theory to our students, non-cooperative game theory in that population. There will always be cooperators and always be defectors. So how do you deal with defectors? Those, those who don't want to cooperate and those who don't want to follow the norms and ethics because it's not, it's not in their interest. There will be rogue individuals, rogue states who will never follow those ethics. Any thoughts? Well, if we, um, if we look at the, the whichever industry, the, the issue of non-compliance with the industry regulator is already an extant problem today. Mm -hmm. Whether you have AI or you don't have AI, we have people who are not prepared to play by the rules and are prepared to try to seek every possible competitive advantage. Uh, so the question is whether or not our regulatory mechanisms that we have today are sufficient to deal with that problem. If they are, then we just need to make sure that they adapt for the speed and the scale of those changes that are made possible through AI. Um, now, if fundamentally uh, AI enables a particular type of, mm, how can I put it, a malicious manipulation or uh, malfeasance around business process, well, we need a legislative change and a regulatory change. And I think we just have to position ourselves, inform ourselves, and structure the governance around this process to the point where if such a change is required, we're able to do so in as short a time uh, and in, a, in a, as comprehensive a manner to be able to deal with this. But we have to accept, this is the role of the regulator, that's why you need a regulator, we have to accept there are always going to be such players in this. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I, it, most often, or at least oftentimes in the world of business, people come from the world of business and say, we don't need any regulation, just leave it to us and we'll take care of it. I just don't think that is an option as we contemplate a future of AI, as this diffuses everywhere in society. So we need to start by recognizing, as, as you've heard, the critical role of law and regulation. Um, the good news is that when you think about the ethical principles, they're not necessarily entirely new. 
So in many cases, we have existing laws and regulations that can evolve. They will need to evolve to address these new areas. And as you heard earlier, in some ways, we may be able to evolve them in particular vertical industries and markets. I do think because the technology is so global, it's going to be especially important to have a global conversation and at least seek a potential global consensus in some of these areas. The more there is a global consensus, I think the easier we're likely to find you know, this regulatory future as we all deal with it. We can now open the floor. Uh, I'll start off with the Dean of the Law School who lent us the auditorium. Dean Simon, please. And I must say, it's, it's a pleasant change to hear a technology expert uh, asking for or recognizing the need for more laws rather than fewer. And I think Facebook, having gone through a period of saying, we only need principles, not laws, is, is realizing the errors of that way. I have a purely self-interested question as an educator. Uh, there was a recent case of uh, Ashok Goel, a guy at Georgia Tech, uh, used, uh, introduced a new teaching assistant in his module uh, called Jill that the students could email and along with other teaching assistants. And he didn't reveal to them, and in five months, no one worked out that she was actually an AI system responding to their emails. Uh, and so my question really is what education needs to do differently. It was wonderful to hear you talk about the role for the humanities and social sciences, things that we're currently doing. But I wondered, Brad, if from your perspective, you could talk about some of the things that you think that universities need to do differently. And maybe, um, Dr. Puthicherry, given your responsibility for, for primary and secondary schools, what you think we need to do dif differently at that level to ensure that we're raising people with the skills that are necessary, not for interacting with AI today, but preparing for this brave new world that uh, I think Brad outlined 10, 20 years from now. Well, I'd start by saying I think there's two things that universities can continue to focus on doing differently, and then one thing uh, that I would say they should strive to do the same. I think the first thing that they can consider uh, doing differently is using technology as increasingly they are uh, with distance learning, uh, you know, with providing online things that students can digest online um, and, you know, so-called flip the classroom, if you will. Um, but use technology uh, as a tool, and AI is a tool that is in the technology toolkit. I think the second thing that universities can ask themselves is, how do they reach a broader population? Uh, because we're going to have such a broad reskilling need that I think we're going to need universities and certainly, you know, polytechnics or community colleges to reach more and more people. And I think it calls on universities and higher, the world of higher education to add to its mission. The thing that I uh, think it's important for universities can, to continue to do, I'll say the old fashioned way, is bring people together in person. Um, there's still going to be so much learning that comes from people interacting with each other in person, not just with faculty, but with students with each other. So much learning happens when you bring students from different backgrounds together. Uh, and uh, I don't think we can f afford to give that short shrift. Quite agree. Uh, if I could look at the issue of the primary and secondary schools that you brought up, one of the uncertainties is the extent to which the pace of technological disruption will affect skills over a 10-year horizon. And that's the, uh, that's the challenge for people who are in primary school and secondary school today. We're not talking about jobs that are even imagined today. But what that means is from an education perspective at that level, uh, my current stance is actually we have to focus away from a particular set of uh, technological outcomes to the fundamental cognitive skills that the kids are going to need, the, the, the numeracy and the computational uh, thinking, the literacy, to a much greater depth such that when they then go out into the workplace, they can engage with that reskilling and upskilling and retraining in a way that uh, prior generations have not because they have either been set along a certain path or there's an expectation of leaving the, the formal education space with a particular set of skill set qualifications. So the primary and secondary school space needs to morph over time to a place where you leave with the confidence as well as the ability to then engage in reskilling and, and, and retraining over uh, your career. I, I would differentiate that then from what I would argue are some behavioral norms around the use of technology where I think we do need to get a lot more depth, where it needs to become the norm that you use the flipped classroom approach, the, the exploitation of AI as teaching assistants, uh, the, the ubiquity of, of technology within the educational space, because that changes the behavioral norms that will allow the kids in primary school and secondary school today to then adapt to that type of future that we're hoping they will encounter. The only, other, the only thing, uh, other thing I will add is AI will get increasingly sophisticated. You could ask the question today whether the students fail to recognize that 
the computer was answering their question because the computer was very good or their expectations of the professor were very low. <laughs> you, so we'll have to see. <laughs> you were very kind. You didn't make any comment about the quality of the students. No. <laughs> okay, uh, the gentleman at the back, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm Kevin. I'm from Nanyang Polytechnic, uh, one of the educational institutions you mentioned. I've been stalking uh, Microsoft uh, executives. In fact, last month we met up with uh, Steve Cox and I asked him one question which I shall pose to you because Steve didn't answer it. Uh, the key question is this, regarding the seeing AI by pivot head and all that. Uh, the idea of uh, AI being able to understand emotions is interesting. My assumption is, and my question to Steve was, will there be a time, maybe about 5 to 10 years time, where AI develops empathy? With using things like facial uh, codification by Eckhart and you know, all this sort of uh, quantum computing coming on board, my question is, can this mystery be solved by AI? And if that's the case, will all those soft skill jobs be a threat? Thank you. Thank you. That's a great question. and. Um the first thing I would say is we may reach a point where computers can emulate the understanding of, a, of empathy. Um, I don't think that is the same thing as developing empathy uh, itself. Um, you know, but already you, know, you're, you were able to discern, as you saw in that video, uh, oh, that person is uh, smiling. Uh, you know, we have another uh, application that we like to showcase uh, you have people that you know, walk up in front of a big screen and there's a camera. Uh, and uh, you know, the program basically does two things. It says, is the person happy or angry or sad? Uh, and then it predicts the person's age. Uh, personally, I think it's been designed to predict a lower age than is accurate, but uh, that seems to then make everybody happy. Um, but yeah, in all seriousness, I think the computers are getting better in identifying somebody's emotion, their stress level, and the like. But I think it's a big leap to go from that to filling in the empathetic need that other human beings have. They can fill part of the gap. I mean, we've actually had uh, you know, a service in China with a chat bot you know, that does fill some of the void that, say, lonely people might be confronting. Um, but I don't see a future, at least in the next decade or two, or maybe beyond for some lengthy period of time, when any of us as human beings are really going to feel that that response for a computer you know, makes up for the response we want from a human being. And as long as that's the case, I think we're going to depend on whether it's nurses or therapists or counselors. You know, for just something that's fundamental to uh, our lives uh, as humans. Hopefully you'll say that that at least answered your question, even if you weren't necessarily satisfied with the answer. Just a comment, because some, of, uh, some people, they don't do a much better job than AI in terms of their empathetic response. <laughs> so yeah. I'm not too sure what, what, what's the future for that, but anyway, thank you for your answer. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, in the interest of time, I will bundle four questions uh, together. So, uh, the gentleman here, and then the gentleman there, and then the two, the two at the back. First, sir. Uh, I'm Quickly. Roland Yap from NUS. Uh, so, the discussion is clearly very important. AI is, you know, making probably in the short term major changes to society. However, I'd like to point out some technical challenges. So, you know, many important issues like transparency, bias, fairness, privacy, all these things, they are clearly important and we should discuss them. However, in computer science, we don't actually know the solution. And, right? Safety, we don't know how to do safety yet. Uh, explanation, we don't know how to do explanation. So if you look at like the European GDPR, which sort of hints as the right to explanation, I'm not sure whether you know, tech companies can really satisfy that. Or not so. Brad had an interesting point about the uh, hippocampus. So sorry, sir. Can you uh, get to the question? Oh, okay. So, uh, so the point is that I'm not sure whether we quite ready to have legislation for this or not because it's not clear how one could satisfy the legislation. Okay. Like, for example, right to explanation. And and the other side point was that 
what Brad mentioned about Hippocratic Oath may be more relevant than maybe we should just ask people to sign up okay. for the oath. All right, thank you. Are we ready for uh, legislation? Gentleman here, please. Okay, uh, the gentleman here and then the lady, uh, Lourdes. Uh, I, think, I think it's good. Okay. Okay, hi, I'm Ben from the Kennedy School. Um, so I just want to pick up on a point on removal of bias. So I thought of these things as perennial contestations, right? Someone's bias is someone's business model. So I'm just wondering how you would think about removing bias because when Mercedes decides that they're going to they're gonna protect the person in the, in the driverless car and kill the pedestrian, mm -hmm. that is bias to some and business model to another. So how, how do you go about removal, re removing this bias? I'm curious. So Thank the you. Totally pro problem. Uh, the gentleman, okay, the lady first. Look, look at this. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm just, uh, I just would like to go deeper into the concept of transparency. It's very interesting that GDPR, for example, hints towards that. But as we know, opaque algorithms actually perform in, in some ways better than more transparent algorithms. So from your point of view, both to the minister and to Brad Smith, um, how do you uh, balance the two? Like, to what extent should we go for more transparency in algorithms? versus benefits of more opaque algorithms. Okay, the last question, please. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, I'm Shamik Kundu, I'm Chief Data Officer of Standard Channel Bank, and uh, more relevantly, a member of the MAS Committee. Uh, my question is um, for, uh, for the Minister. Um, I know we all talk about how the skill sets required in the future are going to be more around the softer side, but don't you think, both in Singapore and elsewhere, the thrust of preparing for the future is too much around data science computer science, etc. Are we actually putting our money where our uh, mouth is and investing enough in humanities and soft skills? So the first question was about the possibility of legislative change. I mean, I'm not suggesting we're about to enact anything anytime soon, but we need to understand that that may be necessary. Uh, well, actually, what we have been doing for the last couple of years is talking about regulatory sandboxes. And I think that's the approach that we need to take around uh, the potential for legislation, that once the uh, social, economic, and business cases made for a particular type of uh, deployment of either technology or business model, which isn't adequately covered under our current regulatory structure, to then develop a conceptual regulatory sandbox. And we have a number of those running today in Singapore. Some are physical, some are conceptual, uh, some are focused on particular use cases. But do so in a way that allows us to inform what legislative change may be necessary. So in a sense, that structure is, is, is I think, present and, and works for us for now, but we need to do so with the lens to think, we, we must not imagine that our current legislative and regulatory processes and structures are automatically going to be sufficient for the future. We need to have a mindset which is prepared to change. For that. So that's one thing. Uh, with respect to the issue of the trolley problem, yes, uh, these are not simple problems to solve. Uh, when I talked about objectively demonstrable, I mean, in a way, I'm not so immediately concerned in saying that about something as obvious as what is the, what the trolley problem may be. If Mercedes has, in your example, uh, made an explicit decision to go for the pedestrian and to protect the lives of the, of the uh, occupants of the car, that immediately becomes an opportunity to have the social discussion between the industry players, the regulators, and the wider society. I'm more worried about hidden biases, where for every you know, 10,000 job applications, you only allow uh, 4,999 women versus 5,001 men, where you need uh, an AI data set approach to interrogate your process to then establish that minuscule proportion of bias, which nevertheless becomes significant over a large period of time or a large number of instances. And that was, that's the kind of approach that I think we need to take around that. I think if you, if you have, as a, as a manufacturer, already made your mind up that you are going to program in the bias this way, well, frankly, you need to persuade your consumers that they want to be driven in a car that will do that. Um, so in a sense, the opportunity for having that public debate is automatically there. I'm more worried about the bias that is not easily seen and not easily understood. Uh, similarly, I would take a similar approach to the issue of, um, I think the, the third question is about safety. Was that, uh, was that, was that right? Transparency. Lost, lost tra transparency. 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 Ah, transparency. Um, so I'm not suggesting that we need to know exactly what happens in the black box, but I think we need to have a series of expectations uh, from both regulators as well as industry that the black box needs to, be, it ha needs to have been interrogated and demonstrated to work in a certain way. 
you, you, may, you don't want to necessarily reveal your internal algorithms, but I, I give you an analogy, which is the pharmaceutical industry. We are not expecting that uh, you need to, as a, as a pharmaceutical industry player, for example, uh, explain your entire chemical processes and your internal uh, safety procedures, but you will need to have demonstrated a body of literature, a set of data, and a set of real-world experiences which demonstrates that your product is safe in these circumstances, and this is where it goes wrong, and these are the mitigating uh, uh, strategies that you will use. And I think that is the kind of expectation we need to have around AI tools and technologies, where that black box, if it becomes proprietary information, has been demonstrated to work in a certain way. And it need not actually, it may not be reasonable for it to be 100% safe. It's not about no harm or no risk. It's about a tolerable, understandable risk profile, which is then objectively demonstrated. Um, and then the last point was about uh, the humanities. Well, it depends on what you mean by putting your money where your mouth is. We make these options and these opportunities available. Ultimately, this becomes an issue of personal choice. I really do hope what you're not suggesting is that we should prevent people from pursuing certain subjects and make them pursue certain subjects. Parents and children and the young people who come to schools like this need to look at their economic future and largely they do make fairly rational choices about what will create for them job opportunities. So that's going to be the ultimate test of whether we are doing the right thing. And I think the important thing is to produce an ecosystem where a young person can make a reasonable choice around those matters. Astrid is uh, sending me the time signal, so we leave the last word for Brad. Well, what I, I would say is I think that your questions very helpfully illustrate the fact that we've reached a point when it comes to AI and understanding what a lot of the right questions are, but we have some work to do to figure out what the answers are. Uh, if you take the transparency issue, especially something like explainability um, or you know, just the degree to which algorithms should be published, you know, I, th I think we're at a point in, in saying that publication of algorithms may well not be the answer, uh, both because they are difficult to uh, really understand when they're published and, and frankly, um, it may well undermine incentives for innovation uh, because a lot of algorithms are treated as trade secrets. Um, but then we do have to really think about how we do make these decisions explainable and, and transparent. Uh, the, uh, the, the phrase objectively demonstrable, I think, is a good one. It helps us take a step forward, but we have a, a lot more work to do in ways that will require the technologists and the regulators and others and academics to come together and identify you know, certain approaches that we then can conclude are most likely to bear fruit. Uh, I think when we think about fairness and bias, um, I think that the approach to, to consider hidden bias is very helpful. I do think we need to keep in mind that we live in a world today, it doesn't matter what country you're in, where the law doesn't declare that all bias is prohibited. It declares that certain kind of biases are prohibited. We expect banks to actually be able to discriminate to some degree on the basis of whether someone is likely to be able to repay a loan. But we don't typically, in most countries, accept an outcome where the banks generalize based on that and discriminate against people of a certain race because of some statistical correlation they may find. So we have this body of law that we can build on, and then we have to decide how we carry it forward and how we apply it to decisions that are being made by computers, or at least decisions that are being made based on help by computers. And this is an area where we, we may well find that there is a set of, of vertical uh, industry-specific regulations that make the most sense. Ultimately, I think this sort of takes us back to the first question, which is, are we ready to regulate today? And yeah, I think we need to expect regulations to emerge over the course of the next five years. I think if we said, don't worry, this is 20 years away, we would find that the regulations arrive too late and the problems have become too big. Uh, at the same time, I think if we tried to write all of the laws and regulations that we're likely to need in the next nine months and say 2018 is the year, we're going to move too fast and we're going to get a lot of things wrong. Um, but I do think we need to move with some urgency. Uh, and uh, I think that at the end of the day, that's why these uh, kinds of institutions like LKY and others uh, are going to be so important. Uh, we're going to need a lot of work 
done in a very collaborative way, uh, perhaps more quickly than uh, we're used to societally around the world. On that note, unfortunately, the AI-powered world is also running out of time. So uh, please join me in thanking Brad and uh, Minister Janil for their time. <laughs>